Reconciliation is not going to come easy. The signs of a deeply rooted problem can be seen all over Canada. In 2018, two incidents in a small southern Alberta town on the edge of Canada's largest reserve made national headlines. Blood tribe members say they weren't isolated incidents. You know, my youngest boy, when he got taken away, and you know, I, I could still picture his smiles, you know, laughing, and, you know, those little taken away. Our family kind of kind of got torn apart ever since that time. The town of Carston has become very used to treating First Nations people like this. There's a system set up in this town to fail First Nations people. If you injure us. He must have been going pretty fast. We're not going to have any repercussions. Jason Steele's son was struck and killed by a car. Sometime later, tragically, Jason too was struck by a vehicle here in Cardston. He's now confined to a wheelchair. How's she doing now? She's doing okay. What do you think he was saying to you? Well, I mean, there's no witnesses. He no. Tell you what. I didn't come to Carson, Alberta to talk to Jason. I was working on a story about the history of white supremacy in Canada when an Indigenous woman was denied service in a restaurant and a doctor made some angry comments to a group of Indigenous men. I went to Carston to investigate. And that's when I met Jason. And this is just one story. You will meet many people that have similar stories. The sheer number of people who came forward with disturbing allegations of racism made it clear to me. The story in Cardston needed to be told. It's an example of something that happens all over Canada. A good sized town located near a First Nation often brings out the unresolved conflicts of the colonial era. This is just the way it is here. People have normalized it. Now I'm, I'm hopeful because people are starting to speak up and speak out and we're getting, we are seeing some, some progress, so really hopeful. The Blood Reserve is 1,400 square kilometers with a population of more than 12,000 people. It's rich land east of the Rocky Mountain foothills and just north of the border with Montana. The Blood Tribe roots run deep here. Mormons migrated to the area in 1887. They came from Utah by wagon train and founded the town of Cardston. This temple is the striking centerpiece of the town. As this tourism video shows, the locals are proud of their town. The people there are connected to their roots. They're not afraid to get their hands dirty. The locals have a little grit in their eye and warm smile on their lips. And we should look at each other as human beings rather than color race. The mayor of Cardston was eager to talk with me about racism in her town, but scheduling just didn't work out. Mayor Maggie Cronin did email a statement. She wrote that she moved to Cardston from BC, drawn by the community spirit, and felt it was a great place for retirement. She became mayor almost six years ago. And then she writes, colonization and subsequent initiatives from the federal government and church institutions have created severe and difficult wounds in the indigenous community. I greatly wish that over time, these wounds can be healed and our First Nations can begin to experience their rightful prominence in our country. 3,500 people live in this town. Just meters to the right of this sign is the reserve border. And even that's under dispute. The Blood Tribe claims the entire town of Cardston is on reserve land. 
Scott Many Gray Horses explains. 1980 to be precise, there was a standoff between the town and the reserve. See, the reserve, that was the time when it stepped up to take its claim, right? For us guys, the border for our land we claim goes right to the U.S. border, right? Yeah, that was our claim, because on the other side of the U.S. border is the rest of our people. So this town is on our, our reserve, right? It's on our reservation. They call it the big claim. After decades, a Calgary judge heard final arguments last December. Some believe that has raised tensions in town. This is the Red Rooster. So this is where it happened, right there by that payphone. We just park here. I'm meeting with many gray horses because last May he witnessed a Cardston doctor's confrontation with a group of First Nations people outside a convenience store. No, let's step out and we can talk about it. Most were blood tribe members who are homeless, living in tents on the outskirts of town. I, mean, I was walking through this way down the street and um, there was a group of natives standing by the payphone and there was a, a man standing at the door of the entrance and he was holding the door. And while he was holding that door, he was staring at the natives as I come around a van here. And I noticed that. And then he let go of the door and he approached the natives. And when he approached the natives, he walked up to them just as I was getting there, pointed at the group and started to say, all of you guys need to get out of here or get jobs. You guys need to get jobs. And uh, you guys can't keep standing here, being here, being vagrants here all day. You guys need to get out of here. Dr. Lloyd Clark was overheard asking if the group wanted Tylenol 3s, painkillers that can be addictive. He came over and he, he like kind of demanded it, hey, like we needed, like we were doing something wrong. Yeah, like, you know, I understand what happens in this town. There is a lot of uh, alcoholism, drug use, hey, and that's, that's a collision, right? But we didn't create it. No mistaking what was happening there? Well, when he said that, you know, it, it was pretty straight up forward that, you know, that we were getting called down. Yeah, see, we were being told that they didn't want us around to be like that, right? And who's us? That's all of us. We're, we're branded as treaty numbers. Yeah, that's what they, we are to them, right? They don't spend time to come and meet our families or come out to our tribe or anything. He confronted the man. He said, well, you have to admit, I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I said, well, the point that you're making is, you know, you're just causing trouble. Yeah, I think you need to go home and restart your day. People who are uh, the victims of, you know, racist attacks or racist acts um, so often don't have a voice and don't have support to make a complaint. Lethbridge lawyer Ingrid Hess heard about the incident. She traveled to Cartson to find out more. They just needed support in that way and I felt really, you know, upset about what I heard. I sought them out um, to see if I could speak to them and if they were interested in making a complaint. I submitted it um, to two places, to the Alberta Health Services and also to the College of Physicians and Surgeons. She said her concerns go beyond the comments made by the doctor that day. Does how he behaved um, speak to how he practices medicine? In a response to the complaint filed by Hess, Dr. Clark admits to making the comments but insists he's not a racist. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta rejected Hess's complaint, ruling it found insufficient evidence to discipline Clark. That lady was going to buy me breakfast. She kind of looked at me. She's nodding her head. Just a few blocks from the Red Rooster where the incident took place, another Indigenous person tried to get a bite to eat at the local a and I went in there to use the washer, and I came back out, and then I seen these two native couples sitting there having breakfast, and then I went to her and I tapped her on the shoulder, and I told her, excuse me, she looked back at me, and I told her, she said, yeah, I told her, you know, if you can buy me something to eat, she said, yeah, so she got up and she went to buy me something to eat, but that lady that was working there refused. That's never, I just got up and I walked out. Another customer witnessed what happened. 
This white knobby one came to me and he, he tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, excuse me. And I looked at him, told him, yeah. He said, did you want anything to eat? And I said, yeah. I told him, I'll just wait for you over here across the street by those motels on that bench. And he said, all right. So I just went across the street and I was waiting on those benches and then it took about 10-15 minutes for him to come out. Then he came out and he gave me that burger or whatever he bought me. That customer was Nick Dreger. He posted about the incident on social media right after it happened, writing that he tried to order a meal for Shauna. The employee argued with him, saying they had a no loitering policy. Then he believed she got on the phone with police. But he was pretty nice to buy me something to eat. AMW Canada responded. They promised improved employee training and also intended to reach out to Shauna. No, I've never been down there ever since that happened. But the issues in Cardston run deep. After the incident at the Red Rooster, these two women had had enough. What I did was I saw the post and I said, let's set up a peace camp. And right underneath, uh, Kim posted, she said, let's do it. So it took us two days to stay peaceful. When we return, the Peace Camp encourages a community to speak up. This peace camp was set up on the same site as the 1980 standoff. For almost 40 years ago, we had the demonstration in the same place that we camped. There was just under 40 of our people thrown in jail. As a result of that, they had what they call the Ralph, Ralph inquiry and blood tribe. Then we were able to secure our own police force. But of course, there's boundaries. So the town of Cartston has the RCMP and then we have our own police force. The hope was this place would help create a dialogue. Curious locals and members of the media would become educated about the issues Blood Tribe members face. The first, one of the first visitors was the mayor, Maggie, and her town administrator, Jeff Shaw. And she looked, she stopped by and I didn't know it was the mayor and she came up to the teepee and she said, what's happening here? And I said, well, this is a peace camp, and it's, um, we are standing in solidarity of our, the Blood Tribe members that have experienced the racism and discrimination in this area. The camp also was a place for victims to come forward and give testimonials. Her time there allowed Kimberly Weaselfat to envision a brighter future. I would like to walk down the street and have the people smile at me and, and genuinely mean it. You know, how are you doing? That's all, just simple. There's a lot of work for us to do in order for our grandchildren and our, uh, and our children to be safe in this town. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of dark here at uh, Saturday. Some of these store, store owners, you'll be visiting somebody on the street and you're, you know, you were asked to you know, keep moving. I met William Singer and Dan Curley Ryder at the same time. They both had what they described as racially motivated run-ins with local shopkeeps captured on their smartphones. He's telling us that we're a bunch of drunks, drug addicts, and you know, and he's told us all we were a bunch of pigs, and that kind of really upset me, and then, uh, you know, that's why I put it on video. Curley Ryder didn't get his phone out in time to catch the racial slurs. But he caught this. So you rented. We rented for you. We paid. We paid you for. We paid you stay home. You stay your home, right? Go stay your home. We paid you for that. This is our home. We stop gonna pay you. This is our home. I'm still kind of unclear as to what the message he was trying to give you. He, was he telling you to go back to the res, basically? Yeah, he was telling us, you know, you guys, you know, you guys get out of here, you know, go back to the reserve, and you know. I just said, well, this is our, you know, where what we're standing on is our land. Eh? It's really hard when we're trying to work when in this time of reconciliation and you kind of wonder like you know what does it mean like how is it how is it working when we're having this trouble here yeah. singer happened across this altercation let's see what's going on here so why are you videotaping she made we just bought her stealing like 30 dollars worth of stuff let's wait for the cops a woman with a crying child detained in the street by a shop owner a second man approaches singer the camera shuts off 
When it's turned on again, William's wife is now filming. The man approaching the camera blocks the singers from pulling away. Right, you should know the law, right? He stopped traffic and he kept telling me that he was going to throw me in jail because I'm not supposed to film. At the end there. of the video, you see the police show up, a common denominator in the stories we've been told. A quick police response. So there's an incident in town. We call them, they won't show up. If somebody from the town, a non-Indigenous, calls them, they come. So yeah, I don't know what's up with that. I would like to, I would like that answered. Ever since I was able to drive, I turned 18, I've been followed by the cops. Even to this day, I get followed by the RCMP. I, I don't know why. It's probably because of the way I look. Our vulnerable people, and a lot of it, a lot of times, it's our street people, are the ones that are targeted. I get scared too to go home at night. I live downtown. Woodrow Callinglass had many stories. He recalls the violence a friend suffered at the hands of a group of men. Their butt and figure is out on him. They're peeing on him. And Woodrow says he hasn't escaped the violence himself. That truck pulled up as a red one. His boys are in there. Like I know they're white, and they pull out a handgun, pellet gun. They're they're shooting at me, like pew, pew, right beside me, eh? Woodrow says he told the police. So have they ever brought you in to make a no. formal complaint? No, nothing like that. Uh, have they said that they, they started an investigation? Nothing like that, nothing whatsoever. You know, and I tried to so explain. So do you think they have a record of you making these uh, complaints? No, about? no. They just roll up their window and they drive away. We approached the RCMP for confirmation on these incidents, but they haven't followed up with us. Blood Tribe Police Inspector Farika Surrett did talk with Investigates. She wouldn't speak to any incidents that happened outside her jurisdiction on the reserve. She did open up about her experience moving to the area as a young police officer. And I first came to Treaty 7 territory um, to work specifically with Blood Tribe Police Service in 2005. Now, as an Indigenous woman who just happens to be a police officer, I can say that when I first came to Southern Alberta, it was pretty shocking the, the difference in um, the racial tension. She says her police force has not responded to anything close to something racially motivated, but does sense racial strife is more in the open now. Anybody who logs into social media, anybody who turns on a TV, on the radio, uh, it's pretty evident that our society is racially charged right now. And when we put the peace camp up, they, they got some strength. We got strength. We had so much strength that our, our people felt, it felt and they felt that they could walk a little straighter and a little taller. When Weasel Fat and Fox heard we were coming to town, they made sure to feed us a community feast. And they made sure to invite everyone who had a story to tell and there is no way we could feature them all. It was a hit and run and never, they never caught up to that person who did that to me. Edwin Badman says a bylaw officer roughed him up to wake him up while sleeping downtown. Natasha Standing Alone's daughter was struck by a vehicle. Um, amazingly enough she was only in the hospital for a week. She just wanted to get out of here but she had to she couldn't go back to school. She had to recover at home. Which brings us back to Jason Steele. His young son was struck and killed crossing the road, trying to keep up with his mother, who was carrying a load of laundry. I lost my son, and they can't even, like, say, you know, I'm sorry this happened. Nothing was ever done. Nothing was done about it. You have Jason, who frequents the town of Cartston. He's in a wheelchair. He's not that old. Um, and when he's frequenting the town of Cardston, most passerbys will see an individual in a wheelchair, a young individual who appears to be homeless. Sandra Manyfeathers is sitting in with Jason to offer support. So this system failed this family, and um, as a result of that, um, Jason's wife continuously drank until she died, and the family was broken up. Jason eventually was hit by a vehicle in the same town, um, and nobody was ever um, jailed as a result of his injuries. Um, he now is reliant on a wheelchair. So when people in this town see Jason, 
they see somebody that is a problem to society. They don't see what is behind this this person that um, has had to deal with all of these issues. Here is where we have to stop and ask the question, is it fair to wrap these accidents in a narrative of racism? They even have a word for being hit by a vehicle here, bumping. We could find no evidence of criminality, but the numbers make you wonder. Right next door on the reserve, the numbers break down like this. 10 incidents, two involved pedestrians who admit fault, no major injuries, none were hit in runs. We also asked the RCMP if charges had ever been laid in connection with bumping, but no one answered us. Blood Tribe Inspector Surrett has this point of view. So although none of the vehicle versus pedestrian collisions that I found in the statistics were found to be racially motivated, I don't think it's anyone's position to dismiss or uh, not believe somebody else's experiences or feelings. People perceive and experience things differently based on a number of factors. So if someone states they've experienced racism, that's their experience and they're entitled to that. In her statement, the mayor appears to believe things will change, writing, I see good things happening, but the complexity of issues, trauma, relationships, and often lack of empathy or understanding from non-Indigenous members of our society make this a difficult but worthwhile challenge to work on and overcome for us all. Due to all the testimonials gathered by the Peace Camp, the Blood Tribe has met with the Alberta government and presented a letter from Chief Roy Fox demanding an inquiry look into the allegations and investigate how rampant racism is in the area. A few years ago, McLean's magazine announced Winnipeg as Canada's most racist city. Racial tensions in Thunder Bay have been well reported. The truth and reconciliation set in stone for all to read Canada's racist past. Headlines caught our attention, put us on the road to Cardston, but it's possible to have had the same experience in Chilliwack. Prince George, North Battleford, Regina. Back on the ground in Cartston, there is anger, mourning. A cross placed on the spot Mira Heinbull's husband was killed, struck by a vehicle. October 9th was seven years since my late husband Leland Brown Weasel, also known as Red Crow, was bumped and dragged maybe a hundred yards, I'll say. For towns like Cardston, this is where reconciliation can begin. And these stories need to be heard. Well, I just want justice done, you know. This has to stop. Enough is enough, you know. You know, like we're natives, you know, and we're not lower than anybody else. You know, we're humans too. We have kids, we have family, you know, and it's causing uh, like a lot of problems, especially for my daughter. I'm trying to um, trying to get her to understand that what happened to her dad that it's you know that it's not acceptable. <laughs>